Join the only roundtable podcast in compliance with five of the top commentators in compliance. Mike Volkov brings 35 years of legal experience. Matt Kelly is the founder and editor of Radical Compliance. Jay Rosen is Mr. Monitor who knows his way around the culture of compliance. And Jonathan Armstrong, a partner at Cordery Compliance in London, rounds out this top group of compliance practitioners. Check out the rants and shout out at the end of each episode. Hosted by Tom Fox, the voice of compliance. Everything Compliance is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. In this episode, we have the full quintet of participants back. Jonathan Marks talks about the IIA's new three lines of defense and why he believes it's a good start but lacking. Matt Kelly takes a look at the Postal Service's attempts to cut service and prevent voting from the compliance perspective. Jonathan Armstrong looks at an absolutely terrifying case out of England, the Aven case around data privacy and data protection. Jay Rosen looks at two recent uh, releases of information from the Department of Justice and what they might mean. And Mike Volkoff takes a one-year look back at the Business Roundtable's statement on the purpose of a corporation and what it might mean going forward. The gang has rants and or shout-outs at the end, so check those out. Everything Compliance is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Matt Kelly, what's on your mind? Uh, Hello, Tom. Well, what is on my mind today is the Postal Service. Uh, As many listeners probably know, it is plagued in scandal and controversy and uh, political suspicion. Um, Most of that probably well-deserved, but I actually wanted to pick out the very apolitical dysfunctions happening at the Postal Service right now. Uh, because there are several that I think uh, speak to why the post office is in such a mess, that those dysfunctions could affect any large organization anywhere. So regardless of your particular political views, uh, I think there's lots of compliance and governance lessons to learn here. Uh, My first one that I had picked out was the conflicts of interest in the new postmaster general, Louis DeJoy, uh, who... President Trump appointed earlier this year, and he took over as Postmaster General in July. And there are a lot of controversies swirling around uh, his stock holdings from his prior career in logistics. Now, DeJoy spent many years building his own business called, I think, New Breed Logistics, which was a subcontractor to the post office. He then got rich by selling it to XPO Logistics a few years ago for more than $600 million, which is more money than I have. Um, And DeJoy wound up serving on the board of directors of XPO Logistics, which is also a subcontractor for the post office. Um, And he still, as of earlier this spring, owned anywhere from 30 to $75 million in XPO Logistics stock. Uh, And also, there are allegations that DeJoy has a stock option in Amazon, which is, of course, a competitor to the post office. So there are a lot of questions about why Louis DeJoy is implementing the reforms that he is at the post office. Is he doing this for some sincere belief that he wants to uh, fix up a defunct operation? Or is he doing this because he somehow wants to um, enrich himself? I don't know exactly what he wants to do. But my point is that there is a conflict of interest here that is visible. And therefore, people do not trust DeJoy's motives. Okay, fair enough. That kind of thing happens. Um, That is what in the corporate world I think would be a grave issue. And your board would probably tell you to liquidate all of those holdings. Um, eliminate the conflict, then you can try and move ahead with your agenda. That's one example of the sort of corporate dysfunction we're seeing at the post office. And you should try to avoid if you are there in the uh, corporate compliance world in the private sector. Um, So here we have this flawed vehicle of a leader. He comes in and he announces all of these changes to the post office. That leads us to our second issue that I think is a teachable moment. Um, The Difference between business objectives, which we talk about all the time in compliance world, 
versus business priorities, which are, I would say, even more important, but we don't really use that phrase all that much. Um, uh, so full, full disclosure, my father was a letter carrier for many years, and I agree with DeJoy and Trump that the financial management of the post office and many of its workplace rules are wackadoo. Uh, my father regaled my family for 40 years with crazy stuff and incompetence and financial waste at the post office. It is an objective that DeJoy should pursue to rectify the financial situation at the post office. That is an objective. But should that be the primary objective for the post office right now, when we have coronavirus everywhere, everybody's going to be voting by mail. And here he is uh, DeJoy saying, I'm going to dismantle um, overtime policies. I'm going to change other policies to slow down mail delivery just so we keep labor expenses down. He is removing mailboxes and uh, taking apart mail sorting machines. Um, as somebody who has known the post office for many years, I can say removal of the mailboxes and the sorting machines so far is not a big deal. The overtime policies, the policies about getting mail that has to be delivered to deliver. That's the big deal. Watch that if these are the things that you follow. But anyways, we have two different objectives in conflict. Either we fix the financial situation or the post office uh, helps to support free and effective elections come uh, November. Which one is more important? Uh, that is the difference between corporate objectives and corporate priorities. Somebody has to decide which one is going to be more important. And we really, we encounter this in the business world all the time. The problem is that there is no consensus about the priorities. Uh, there is no agreement among all the stakeholders about what should come first. Um, so you wind up with this uh, mismanagement and suspicion and culture of distrust um, but really, in the corporate world, it's the same thing. It's just the priorities are typically, are we going to make money or are we going to have ethical business conduct? Those are two separate objectives. Either one could be put first. And most of the corporate conduct scandals we talk about, it's because somebody has decided to put uh, making profit to the primary objective, not doing business ethically as the primary objective. Uh, so appreciate that distinction between corporate objectives, which unto themselves are just a jumble of goals. Which one is more important? Well, it's whichever one the CEO and the leadership says is going to be more important. And if you don't have agreement and consensus on that, everything goes sideways. If you don't have an ability to enforce your priorities, that's when you see things like uh, somebody sneaks off and commits embezzlement or a bribery fraud or something else like that. That's where uh, people in compliance and governance really need to understand that distinction between objectives and priorities. The third and final dysfunction, however, is that I am fascinated by the social media battles that are happening over the post office that are really showing there are different groups out there that are fighting over what the priorities should be. Very clearly, some portion of the electorate believes the priority should be support free and fair elections at all costs um, because they believe Donald Trump is trying to steal the election and he's going to slow down the mail and he's going to use this corrupt CEO to do it. And that's why all this is happening solely so Trump can declare victory in November, even if he is not the actual winner. They think that they to them, that's obvious. At the same time, there is some other group out there. I think people who generally watch Fox News or that other wacko network, OAN, um, who they believe vote by mail is rampant fraud. This is going to steal the election away from Donald Trump. And of course, the post office is a financial mess and we need to save the country by implementing these reforms right now. And both sides are totally convinced that they are right. They have developed these echo chambers. But what they're really What's really happening here is social media has allowed these subsections of different stakeholder groups because the post office has employees and customers and taxpayers who pay for it and managers and congressional oversight. And there are different 
subgroups within each of those stakeholder groups that are using social media to form alliances across group and redefine what they believe the priority should be. And it goes back and forth, and we're just going to fight over this endlessly until November. Um, appreciate that any large organization can fall victim to that. And many large organizations, those of you listening, you probably have experienced this already. You might see employees and consumers form some sort of social media coalition about what products you're going to unveil, what products you might have to pull off the, the market, uh, what policies you're going to have, or what customers or business partners you're going to have. And social media allows people to try to hold companies to different sets of accountability more aggressively. And you can have multiple groups trying to hold you to multiple standards of accountability, and it's going to tie you into knots. And that's exactly what's happening with the post office. And it could happen with Walmart or Apple or Target or any big high profile company. You're all vulnerable to that. Bad news is I do not have an answer for how you fight social media battles like that. I just know that that is the maelstrom upon which this conflicted CEO who's come in with suspicions about his objectives and priorities has injected the post office into that social media maelstrom. And now here we are fighting over it. And those are the three things people need to watch because that also could happen to anybody else who's listening there today. Jonathan Marks, do you have any questions for Matt? No, I, I think it's just more of a comment. I, you know, I, I don't mind people, you know, voicing their opinion on social media. And I certainly don't mind people speaking up about certain things. But, you know, you know, we have a we have a, we have a society right now where if somebody says something, you know, it's almost um you know, it, it could be taken the wrong way. And, you know, I, I'm talking about, you know, take a look at shareholder activism and you have a shareholder that speaks up that really doesn't have all the facts or, you know, a short seller that, you know, burbles their way into the boardroom. Um, and, you know, not that they don't have or don't bring out good or salient points, but more often than not, I think some of the things that we're finding is, is that they have half truths or they don't have their facts straight. But mm -hmm. the damage is already done because they're fighting this in the in the public. And, you know, people look at corporations and big companies as sort of the, you know, the devil today. And so I just wanted to hear your comments with regard to that, Matt. I think that's an excellent point. And I don't have a good answer for that either. But, you know, what I've always liked to say is that social media is not a new risk unto itself for corporations. Sure. It is more that it amplifies and accelerates those risks you already had. Um, you know, I think the idea about a short seller, that's absolutely right. Some short seller going off half cocked, trying to talk down a share price. That is nothing new. That's been around for decades. But what happened with social media now is that, well, now people will actually listen to that short seller and not necessarily know that you know, this guy's clueless or this guy has an ulterior motive. Um, and then these things snowball and pe people build alternate realities on social media, um, parallel realities, really. And then when you get so swept up in what you think your beliefs are, like I said earlier, it's the difference between objectives and priorities. Well, now you've got parallel groups absolutely convinced that their priorities are the best and correct, and we're just going to have to fight life or death for ours and the other opposing sides. And there might even be more than two sides fighting this. Um, you know, they're absolutely going to fight this, too. I mean, it, I even am uncomfortable talking about both sides over this vote by mail and voter fraud myth, um, because there is no other side. There is no argument that vote by mail leads to rampant vote fraud. There is a belief, but there's no argument. There's no side there. Um, but nonetheless, everybody who believes that vote by mail is fraud, um, they're absolutely convinced that their view is a legitimate side. And it's just, you know, you might as well believe that vote by mail is is a plot by aliens too. Um, so yeah, like I don't have an answer to it, but you see it time and again that people can exploit social media even with the best of intentions, but they get the the worst sort of results. So Jonathan Marks, on a previous episode in your rant and or shout out, you talked about the IIA's new three lines model. And you applauded them for 
moving towards that direction, but you chided them somewhat for, in your opinion, not going far enough. I was wondering if you had continued to think about that, and what are your thoughts on that today? Yeah, Tom, I, I have continued to think about it, and although it may be somewhat busy, I think that there are um, there there are things that were obviously left out, and, and I'll tell you why. You know, I think it's really self-serving to the Institute of Internal Auditors to assume that from a de- even when they had the, they called it the three lines of defense, that defense really consisted of you know you know management compliance. You know, compliance really wasn't even defined that well an internal audit. I, I think there's a lot of other things that come into play here, which I think the regulators are bringing out. For example, you know, I, I think they could have developed the compliance uh, function uh, more fully. They did not do that. You know, they are an independent validator of integrity. Uh, they should have brought that out. Whereas internal audits, an independent, you know, uh, assurance provider to the organization, they left out the general counsel's office. I believe that the general counsel should have been included in the model as sort of the independent guardian and the key roles that they play in ongoing evaluation of laws, regulations, and guidance and identifying legal risks and providing advice to the business and defending the organization zealously. And then, you know, obviously communicating and collaborating. Nothing new to anyone that's ever listened to me, but I've always said the Bermuda Triangle of an organization is when compliance, internal audit, and general counsel are not operating, you know, harmoniously amongst each other. And so, and then the, the bigger things that I think that um, some of the bigger things that were sort of obvious omissions to me was accountability. You can have the best internal controls in the world, but if, if management's not held accountable, then, you know, I'm sorry, then you might as well not have any internal controls. So, you know, I, I looked at the model. I, I looked at, you know, what they try to do. I applaud them for trying to moving it forward. I, I agree that, you know, you, you can't look at this always as a, sort of a defensive posture. There has to be offense. And I think what they're really focusing on there, which leads me to my next topic, is there is good risk. And, you know, companies really need to understand what their good risks are. You know, risk appetite, I think COSO tried to redefine that a little bit this year. It's a really an amorphous concept when you come to think about it. But, um, you know, there are good risks to take. And if you don't take good risks, sometimes you don't grow. And so um, that's why... I developed my own model that was adapted from the IA's model, which actually has, uh, and I know some people don't like this, but I have COSO as sort of my foundation, you know, underneath all of this. I think COSO provides not only principles that are easily adaptable, both from an organizational perspective and from an audit perspective and a compliance perspective, but also from an overall management perspective. Um, I also think that COSO is really moving towards or more towards enterprise-wide risk management. Um, you know, I believe that the, the end game of all of this is truly enterprise wide risk management. And that's why I labeled my model the enterprise risk resilient ecosystem, because I believe that when you have management compliance, internal audit and the general counsel working and collaborating together, um, along with, you know, good communication and understanding and delegation and direction from the board of directors and the committees, I think things like when we talk about integrity, leadership, strategy, transparency, and monitoring, I think those things are easily more adaptable in an ecosystem that has that general understanding. And then the last point that I really wanted to make is that we all know today that you can't have a set it and forget it environment and that you really do need the feedback loop and lessons learned in order to continue to enhance your compliance program, your internal audit function, even the general counsel, you, you definitely need feedback. And, and all of that feedback, I think, is, is, is great. But then where in the model are the, regular, the regulatory bodies or the external assurance providers? You know, I think the independent auditors today play a vital role in not only educating, you know, um, the, the company on accounting issues, but I think they also have good insight into business issues and benchmarking and things of that nature. And then from a regulatory perspective, you know, as sort of the independent, you know, from an independent examination and a feedback perspective, we all read deferred prosecution and non-prosecution agreements. We all look at the appendices and see what the requirements are. So how do you not take that feedback? How do you not take those lessons learned and build them into a model where you're marching towards a more business intelligent and a more enterprise resilient um, ecosystem uh, to deal with today's issues, which, by the way, 
you know, we talked about social media with Matt. I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these risks are new and emerging and they're fast and furious. And I think that if you look at a model this way, although it may seem busy to some, I think it sends a very, very clear picture. And I think the danger that we have today is you look at an organization like the Institute of Internal Auditors and you launch something like this out there and many people will not think about it. They'll just glom onto it. And I think if you glom onto the model that they released and what they put forth, I think there are key components that are missing. And I think there's there's going to be a propensity to kind of fall back on that as 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 one's comfort zone. And I don't think that's the direction that the regulators are heading by any stretch of anyone's imagination. So, Jonathan, uh, in terms of the feedback that you talked about, as you know, the Department of Justice in the 2020 update to the evaluation of corporate compliance programs uh, re-emphasized or more strongly emphasized data information leading to continuous monitoring and continuous improvement in looking at your model, where does that fit in? Where does it fit in? I think it fits in everywhere. I mean, I think it fits in the compliance function. I think it fits in an internal audit. I think management has to take a good hard look at it. I think if I'm an audit committee member today or I'm, I'm on some other risk committee, I'm going to want to be looking at that from a, an overall monitoring perspective. Um you know, if you look at some of the oversight, I put in my model, I have some oversights and key roles, you know, and, um, you know, I, I think it's embedded in there. I don't think this is something that's perfect, um, but I think it's something that sends a better message when it comes to not only monitoring, um, you know, monitoring and transparency and all the key things that you need from an organization and using that data effectively. But I, I, I think what it does do is I think if you look at, how I laid the model out and the communication and collaboration and the key roles that need to be done, you know, by default today. And if you do read the regulator, you know, what the regulators have put out, for example, in the ECCP and their emphasis on data and using data as a tool or a weapon in order to fight, um, you know, uh, let's just say bad behavior or misbehavior. I think that, you know, that is definitely built in here. Matt, do you have a question for Jonathan? Yeah, I, I do, I suppose. A, a bit of a comment and a question. Um, one thing that struck me about the new IIA model was that, you know, it really is a bit more, a bit less structured in what titles are in the second line of defense. Um, but I've heard from a couple of different vendors and compliance people that they actually like that uh, this new model seems a bit more useful for smaller businesses. Like a lot of small businesses are not going to have an internal audit function per se, but um, they feel more like this is uh, gives me enough flexibility that I can start to use a model like this too, even though I'm only a small or mid-sized company, not one of the Fortune 500. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts along those lines or if you – have heard anybody else say that the flexibility here is going to be more useful? Well, I, I think there's two things. Number one, I think that's a great point. Number two is I agree that if you look at organizations that are smaller, you know, you will have, you know, we, we, we all talk about this all the time. You will have functions that are combined. For example, you will, you might have general counsel also acting as the chief compliance officer. And that still exists in large organizations as well. You might not have internal audit, but you still need some independent ins assurance function. I think what what by leaving those out, what you do is you by not if I'm a small organization, I know I don't have internal audit, but I do know, know that I need independent assurance. I'm going to say, well, how do I get this? How do I use what I have in order to get this? I think by leaving it out, I think what you assume is that someone will take that. And I think this is where I was talking about before. You run the risk of people running with what's actually published and they're not thinking through these issues. Um so, you know, I would rather see what is what is what would be sort of the, the best landscape or the best the best ecosystem that I could put forth, identify those gaps and deficiencies, or if in fact it's a cost issue or it's a size issue because we just don't have the proper resources, how do I how do I cover off on these particular areas? You know, do I go outside? Do I hire somebody independent to do some special work for the board? You know, does the board take on a little bit more a different role? 
um, other different committees that are focusing on different things. For example, you know, in a general structure of a board, you might have an audit, a finance, you know, a compensation, a governance committee. You know, maybe there is a controls committee that's set up, you know, just to look at those particular things in a smaller organization from an oversight perspective. So while I think that's true that it does sub provide some freedom and flexibility, I always like to know my preference would be, and if I was, you know, even in the not-for-profit that I am the chairman of, um, you know, I'm the chairman of the board of, you know, I look at something like this and I go, okay, fine. How do I get independent assurance that, you know, what we say is in place is in place? And, you know, does that come from working with my external auditor a little bit more closely and saying, hey, you know, I know you're going to do these procedures, but we'd also like you to take a look at this. And the answer to that is yes. And those conversations do happen. So while I, I definitely applaud, again, the simplistic nature and, you know, the, 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 the good riddance of the word defense, I don't really know that there's any lines. I think that you have to look at this from an ecosystem perspective. So um, I don't know if I answered your question 100 percent, Matt, but, um, you know, hopefully I, I share with you my opinion as to why I think it's important to have all the elements there and then, you know, kind of work with what you really need uh, and the resources that you do have in order to make sure that you do cover off on risk. Because I got news for you, small organizations, as we well know, you know, if you have a fraud in a smaller organization, it could, it could pose a much bigger impact than a fraud in a larger organization for a whole various, for various and sundry reasons. Mike Volkoff, do you have a question or comment for Jonathan? I got a quick question, Jonathan. Uh, I read uh, in another publication or another website um, a criticism of the new three lines of defense in that it um, uh, did not recognize sufficiently the compliance function and uh, the line of sight that's required by the compliance function across the entire business, the responsibility for ethics and compliance for maintaining an ethical culture, and that somehow uh, in the new three lines model, it diminished the role of compliance. Is that an accurate criticism or, or how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I said that in my opening diatribe that I think it was really, really self-serving of the, you know, the, you know, the Institute of Internal Auditors to kind of leave out compliance. Um, you know, um, I also think it's really self-serving that they you know, ignore the role of the general counsel plays here. And, you know, I think if you have an organization that is of proper size, again, this, you know, there needs to be some scalability. And Matt, your point is really well taken there. But, um, you know, I think it does diminish the role of compliance. I think it, and, and I think if you don't put that in there, I think what you force people to say, or you may lead people down a path of, well, maybe it really isn't that important because, you know, I, again, I think, you know, just like, you know, getting a, a, a lovely letter from a short seller or somebody or somebody posting something on a, on a, on a blog site about a company, you know, I think this is one of those things where the Institute of Internal Auditors has a responsibility so I think hundreds of thousands of members globally, and I, I don't know whether people have the full depth and breadth or knowledge of really how this all came together, what it's supposed to mean and how to apply it. And I, 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 while I think there's some merit to what they did, I think there's a lot of danger by excluding these key components. And that's why I took it upon myself to not only re, you know, reconfigure the model to something where I think is generally workable um, and added accountability, the external assurance providers, the regulatory bodies and, you know, COSO is the underlying foundational framework, which most organizations do use. Um, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that somebody will look at this and say, if I'm going to put together a program, you know, these are the elements that I'm going to need to go forward in order to be successful. Jay Rosen, we had a couple of pronouncements from the Department of Justice over the past week or so. Uh, or over and around the FCPA. What uh, caught your eye? Thanks, Tom. Uh, it's fun to be manning the DOJ desk today. And first up, um, three women were charged last Friday in a 13-count indictment for their alleged roles in an adoption scam involving Ugandan and Polish children with bribing officials and defrauding adoptive parents, U.S. authorities, and a Polish regulatory authority. Two of the women were charged with FCPA offend, uh, offenses. The three uh, people charged are Deborah Paris, 68, of Lake Dallas, Texas, Dora Marembe, 41, of Kampala, Uganda, and Margaret Cole, 73, of Strongsville, Ohio. 
the DOJ didn't name the adoption agency. Um, sorry, uh, didn't name the adoption agency where Cole and Paris work, but local reports from Ohio said the FBI have been investigating a now closed nonprofit agency called European Adoption Consultants, EAC, that was based near Cleveland. In late 2016, the State Department debarred the agency for three years. The FBI subsequently raided the agency's offices in 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 February of 2017. Cole was the executive director of EAC. With respect to the specific scheme in Uganda, uh, Mirembe and others engaged in a scheme to pay bribes to Ugandan officials including justices and welfare officers, to secure the adoption by families in the United States of Ugandan children who were not properly determined to be orphaned. Some of the bribes were paid to welfare officers who recommended children be placed in orphanages without properly being determined to be orphans. Bribes were also paid to Ugandan court registrars who would assign the hearing to corrupt adoption-friendly judges. To fund and disguise the bribery, EAC began charging its clients quote, foreign program fees, unquote, that often told more than $10,000 per client. According to the indictment, some of the clients of EAC believed the children were not knowingly given up for adoption by their mothers, and some of the children were returned to the families in Uganda. The DOJ said that between 2013 and 2016, EAC and Marembe procured more than 30 Ugandan children for U.S. parents. The indictment also included a scheme to defraud U.S. and make false statements to adoption regulators in the U.S. and Poland related to the adoption of Polish children. Regarding the Poland scheme, the DOGA said that after the clients of the EAC determined they could not care for one or two Polish children they were set to adopt, Cole and Perkins took steps to transfer the children to Paris' relatives. Finally, this past September in 2019, Robin Longoria, 58, of Mansfield, Texas, pleaded guilty in federal court in Ohio to one count of conspiracy to violate the FCPA and to commit wire and visa fraud for her role in the Uganda adoption scam. Longoria hasn't been sentenced yet. A hearing is scheduled for October 14th of this year. So that's the first story. And the next story that's very interesting is the DOJ has had their first opinion release in the last six years. Um, it's it, opinion release 20-01, and at first blush, it appears to be a straightforward recitation of the equivalent of a black letter law in the world of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. However, a more expansive reading provides some very interesting insights into both international and anti-corruption and FCPA enforcement actions and may give a preview of where things are headed. Here are the facts. The requester desired to purchase some assets of a foreign investment bank, Country Office A, which was indirectly owned by the foreign government. To facilitate the transaction, it enlisted the assistance of a different foreign subsidiary of the same investment bank, uh, Country Office B. After the transaction was complete, Country Office B sought compensation for their work in facilitating the transaction. Country Office B provided various legitimate and commercially viable services, and the fee sought was commercially reasonable. The payment would be made directly to Country Office B. A quick review of the analysis demonstrated by this transaction was straightforward under the FCPA. First, the payment would be made to Country Office B and not any individual. And second, the payment was for legitimate services rendered and was commercially reasonable. At this point, most compliance practitioners would say the transaction is permissible under the FCPA. Yet there was another set of analysis which bears closer scrutiny. Second, based on the representations of the requester, there is no indication that the requester intends or believes the money will be diverted to any individual, and there is no indication that the money will in fact be diverted to any individual. The payment is transparent to Country Office B and its management. Indeed, the chief compliance officer of the Country B office has certified to the requester that the payment into the Country B office's corporate bank bank account will only be used to benefit of the Country B office for general corporate purposes. It will not be forwarded to any other entity. So why would these extra steps be taken when the transaction appeared to pass FCPA muster? 
It comes down to a matter that we've looked at before in our discussions, the ENI Shell and the OPL 245 in offshore Nigeria. What was this transaction involving these two international energy concerns? As laid out in the Trace Compendium, the concession of offshore oil block OPL awarded to ENI and Shell by the Nigerian government in 2011 for a payment of $1.3 billion. Emails published by the Global Witness indicate that executives of Shell were informed and had reason to believe to know that part of this payment would go to then-President Goodluck Jonathan. However, prosecutors in Italy had a different interpretation. They brought criminal prosecution against both companies, and according to a report by Reuters, another 13 people involved in the case, including current ENI chair executive Claudio Descalzi and former Shell head of upstream Malcolm Brendan. The prosecutor's basic claim is that ENI and Royal Dot Shell were aware that most of the money they spent to buy a Nigerian oil field in 2011 would go to corrupt payments. So why make all this additional representations when there are not required under the FCPA? Simply put, the fact pattern in ENI Shell and OPL 245 was that the purchasers wanted to buy government assets and pay the Nigerian government directly for these assets. And that is exactly what the relator in 20-01 wanted to do in the transaction at issue, which clearly was in the parameters of the legal transaction under the FCPA. Does this mean that the DOJ and the SEC will now look at the knowledge of how a payment made directly to a foreign government or state-owned enterprise will be used by foreign government or state-owned enterprise? Many commentators have downplayed the opinion release 20-01. However, Tom Fox, who wrote about this earlier this week, found it to be very instructive of where international anti-corruption enforcement may be headed. As our fellow panelist Mike Volkoff is often known to say, the DOJ always communicates its position well in advance of taking actions. Opinion release 20-01 could well be a tea leaf worth reading if we could pretend where the international anti-corruption enforcement is heading for the rest of the year. So, Jay, in terms of the um, FCPA uh, enforcement action, or at least using the FCPA in the first matter uh, you discussed, is that something that uh, you have a sense that occurs, has occurred, or is a potential risk for those in, in adoption agencies, particularly adoption agencies, looking to adopt uh, children from outside the United States and bring them to U.S. families or U.S. homes? Yeah, and it's a good question, Tom. Until I read the article earlier this week, it wasn't something I really considered. Uh, But if if you look at uh, what happens out there in many of these schemes that we see within the FCPA world, you know, it's, it's just like when you started talking about teddy bears coming across the border, nobody thought that that would be a way that you would be breaking the FCPA. So this opportunity here is you have children living in foreign countries being uh, brought here to U.S. parents. So, of course, unfortunately, it does open up uh, the opportunity for people to do fraudulent things. And I think the worst part is is just breaking up of families and how people – You know, somebody can go out and do something like this, but to really take a child from his parents, um, that hits very close to home. So, Mike Volkoff, you uh, wrote just a great series of blog posts this week, looking back, a retrospective one-year look on a statement of on the business roundtable statement on the purpose of a corporation. And you looked at it from from many different angles, and then you ended up with – a blog post where you made some suggested changes or or needed changes. So I was wondering if you might be able to expand on the thoughts from really all four of those blog posts today. Well, uh, we're coming up on the one year anniversary, Tom, of uh, the restatement of corporate purpose that was issued by the business roundtable. And I think we all of us, you know, sort of uh, looked at this as a a great statement. It was a good PR move. But the real truth is what would really be enacted. And it's worth taking a, a a step back just to look at it again, because there were 181 CEOs who signed it. 
And there was all this fanfare about how corporations were going to change their purposes, were going to get off quarterly reports, being the be all and end all of every corporation. Uh, and they, uh, there were some principles that they talked about, including, uh, and I'll just quickly go through them, five. Uh, one was delivering value to our customers. Uh, second was investing in our employees. Third was dealing fairly and ethically with our suppliers. Four was supporting the communities in which we work. We respect people in our communities and protect the environment by embracing sustainable practices across our businesses. And last was generating long-term value for shareholders who provide the capital that allows companies to invest, grow, and innovate. And we are committed to transparency and effective engagement uh, on uh, with shareholders. And uh, not to be cynical, uh, and it's easy to be cynical in today's world, but uh, I, I think that when you take a look at this and say, okay, what did these 181 leaders uh, do in the last year? And I recognize we have to be a little bit more patient because of the COVID-19 uh, you know, virus and pandemic and the, the economic disruption. But if there ever was a time for a corporation to embrace some of these principles, maybe it was during this time. Maybe it was a, a time where people could invest in their employees, where they could support the communities in which they work. Um, and maybe this was really the test. And I think the companies, for the most part here, have fallen way short. And so is this really a cynical ploy? It was just a PR move for one day, for two days in today's, you know, quick moving world. So I, uh, I then went back to um, and wrote this series this week to sort of review corporate boards because I have just uniformly identified corporate boards is usually the responsible party in many of the enforcement actions that we talk about, either directly being involved or indirectly failing to conduct meaningful oversight. I'm still convinced that corporate boards don't know how to oversee a ethics and compliance program. They, they need to be trained on that first and foremost. But we also have really serious problems at the board level with diversity. Uh, and I don't mean just gender diversity or ethnic diversity, but also professional diversity. And I know, Tom, uh, you and others have been proponents of having a compliance representative on a corporate board. And I think that's just the beginning because I think other professions could play a role on uh, corporate boards. The average age of a board member is over 70 years old. And even, uh, even today in this supposedly more politically correct world, we have 19% of board members nationwide in the Russell 3000 that are uh, uh, females. I mean, it's, this is just crazy. Uh, you know, uh, you have uh, new board members that are being filled at a higher rate for women and minorities, but we're still woefully short. And this is in comparison to other countries uh, in Europe, for example, that require 40% of the board members to be female and mandate diversity. We have California now mandating minimum uh, diversity requirements. So uh, I think corporate boards have a long way to go. I think the statement of purposes uh, is, uh, is really a way to hold companies accountable. And I'd like to see uh, somebody spend more attention on this. But I notice one thing in our community that criticizing board performance right now and criticizing board performance, you don't get as much traction because there are many more uh, sort of what I would call business interests that uh, along with the defense bar, the corporate defense bar, or the corporate bar that sits in there at the board, board meetings, nobody's willing to challenge the system. And the system needs challenging. Uh, and I hope that, you know, that's, we've, you know, there's been a big movement to elevate the compliance function, and there needs to be reform at the board level. And I've talked about this uh, ad nauseum, and, I, and I'm going to continue to push it because I think that's the way we get to real change. Matt Kelly, do you have a comment or question for Michael? I, I do have a uh, comment. I can remember one year ago when we had this uh, monthly podcast, I had said when those business principles were adopted that 
I, I, I am cynical. And um, I said that that was a tacit admission by corporate America that, whoa, wait a minute, maybe a Democratic administration in 2021 is no longer a joke. Uh, we got to get ahead of the Democrats before they wind up running the show. Here we are one year later. And politically, it still seems to me it is quite likely that the Democrats are going to be running the show next year. And I, my comment, I suppose, is I will be very curious to see what happens to these business principles and these sentiments if there is a Biden administration, if Democrats control both chambers of commerce, uh, Congress, which is it's at least plausible. Um, what would they do to put some of these ideas in force, which um, I am not sure how many corporations would actually like to see these principles codified into real things. But I would not rule out that exact outcome happening within the next 12 months or so. So we'll see. Well, could I uh, just a quick comment is I have definitely um, posited that the next time that Congress has to react to a financial crisis, you know, going back to Sarbanes-Oxley, going back to uh, Dodd-Frank, the next time what we're going to see codified are going to be um, compliance requirements and compliance. Uh, and you're going to see all the work that, you, that we've all done uh, sort of uh, appear in legislation that mandates certain requirements for companies. Um, because I think Congress is going to need something to do, and it's going to sound like a good thing to do. And to the extent there's governance reform, more power to them. Mike, how how can a uh, how can a governance reform happen, and how can we move towards having greater diversity, both gender diversity, subject matter expert diversity, and even age diversity? When corporations are governed by state laws, most particularly in Delaware, which has made it clear that the only obligation of a corporate board is uh, and a corporation is around returning value to shareholders. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's the role of shareholders. That's the role of the community. That's the role of, of you know politicians is all of this, I think, is coming to fruition um, I urge, uh, even internally, I urge ethics and compliance professionals to get in front of their board and try to train them a little bit on this, but it's one step at a time. But ultimately, it's going to be political pressure. Uh, like Matt has said, uh, the Democrats are going to look again at corporate performance here. Look, the fact is that you know, you have companies that benefited significantly from the tax cuts and, uh, you know, Apple still doesn't pay much and they pay zero in taxes. Um, you have other companies that pay zero in taxes. And I think that people are uh, tired of that. And I think that there's a reason that there's sort of more populist uh, concern about corporate behavior. And I think that uh, that is going to lead to more political pressure. Obvious. Look, we've even seen it. Tom, you and I did a podcast on sort of the uh, the Caremark decisions uh, that came along. Even the Delaware courts have responded. I mean, just ever so slightly, but at least responded to holding two boards accountable for uh, corporate misconduct. And that I think it's a beginning of a trend. And uh, if there's if the Democrats want to use this as a, a leverage point, uh, Matt is is definitely right to call out their leadership role in doing that. They did it with Sarbanes-Oxley and they did it with uh, with Dodd-Frank and we could see a new uh, another one coming. Jonathan Armstrong, what is on your mind? Well, Tom, one of the things that I've been looking at at the moment is the Avon case in the UK. Now, this is going to take a little bit of explaining, and it's a huge judgment that's now out in the case, but it's fascinating on all sorts of levels, I think. So, what does the case involve? Well, it involves the uh, so-called Steele report, the Russian dossier, this um, uh, ragbag of information which uh, uh, related to President Trump's involvement with Russia. And its uh, elements of this report have come to court in the UK in the guise of data protection 
litigation. Now, this is a pre-GDPR case under the old data protection rules, but it has real consequences, I think, firstly, for, for those who are dealing with GDPR, but also, I think, particularly for compliance professionals when they're checking individuals, when they're looking at sanctions rules, when they're doing background checks on potential business partners. I think this case has a lot of ramifications. So what's the case about? Well, it concerns three individuals, uh, Avon, Friedman, and Khan, and they were what the court called businessmen of Russian or Ukrainian origin. They were connected to a Russian conglomerate called uh, Alpha Group. And Christopher Steele, many of you will remember, was the British guy who was all over the news in the U.S. Uh, a couple of years ago with his consultancy, uh, Orbis, because they had compiled a report in 2016 on Trump's involvement with uh, Putin and the Russian regime, which uh, had been commissioned, it seemed, via a, a U.S. law firm on behalf of individuals who may have been connected to the Democratic Party. Now, uh, as a result of Steele's commission, which was surprisingly low value, I think, to me, uh, he produced a number of memos. You might remember that some of those found their way into the public domain, uh, including on uh, BuzzFeed. And the three individuals concerned have ongoing litigation in the U.S. over the content of those memos. They had one case uh, struck out uh, basically on, on, on free speech grounds in the U.S., but they also brought this litigation to the U.K. on the basis that Steele and his company uh, were based here. And they objected really to... Uh, uh, some elements of the memo, including the fact that Putin and the three individuals had done significant favors for each other, the fact that two of the three individuals were giving informal policy advice to Putin, the fact that one of the three individuals had met uh, directly with uh, Putin shortly before another meeting, the fact that two of the three individuals uh, had uh, used a particular individual to deliver large amounts of what were called in the report illicit cash to Putin when he was the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg, and the fact that two of the three individuals were doing Putin's political bidding. And this was a data protection case because the three individuals said that the processing of their data in question breached the data protection legislation. Now, data protection legislation under GDPR and the old regimes, fairly similar, has six principles of data protection. And under the old legislation and the new, they include principles relating to fairness, fairness and lawfulness, which is now principle A, and also the accuracy of data. And the three individuals said that they, the processing of their data wasn't fair or it wasn't lawful or it wasn't uh, accurate. And so the court had to dig in to a lot of these allegations and look at the evidence that was behind them. And the three individuals sought uh, uh, monetary damages, and they also wanted their name cleaned up. Now, I'd mentioned in passing that we are seeing a lot of litigation from individuals connected or formally connected with the Soviet regime. They're often trying to clean up their reputations, partly when they think that they're close to a sanctions uh, regime. But it's always challenging for compliance professionals when we're doing due diligence checks because some organizations are giving way to these demands far, far too easily, in my view. And some news organizations are removing or recasting uh, articles on individuals like this under the white heat of litigation. And, uh, and, and certainly you can say about many Russian individuals, and these individuals may be some, that they're not afraid of litigation. Now, Orbis tried to defend these proceedings and on a number of 
bases. They said that because the report was commissioned by an external law firm, it was for the purpose of obtaining legal advice. And they said that the report was also required to safeguard national security. And they said more generally that the data was accurate and it was fair and lawful, etc. Now, as I said, very long judgment from the court. And in particular, they looked at the meaning of the word illicit. And effectively, they said, and I'm uh, very much summarizing what's a large case, they said that Steele had relied on stuff that was too old. It was these payments were 15 to 20 years before the compilation of the memo. They said that Steele knew his source didn't have direct personal knowledge. He was relying on hearsay. And of course, it's important to say that the burden of proving a fact relies on the person who asserts it. So Steele had the burden of proof and he hadn't uh, met it, uh, particularly when he was, uh, you know, the word illicit suggested something uh, underhand. So uh, none of the other breaches were really established under the Act, but the court did award individuals to two of these three individuals. And the court awarded them £18,000 each. And this appeared to take into account the distress they'd suffered and their reputational harm. Now, damages could be slightly higher under GDPR because the things that you can claim for expand slightly. Um, But it's interesting here that the judge said that the two individuals were of, quote, robust character not given to undue self-pity, and he awarded what he called modest damages, effectively because he said that they were thick-skinned individuals and uh, and that they hadn't um, uh, been tarnished much by uh, these allegations that are made against them. Uh, As we said, there's ongoing proceedings in the US. Some of those proceedings have been kicked out. Others seem to be pending. It's interesting, I think, that conventionally a lot of individuals like this have brought their uh, litigation under defamation law. We think that could still happen, but it might be that there's an easier and quicker result under data protection legislation. And as I said, this has wider effect. It's not just political parties or uh, news uh, agencies. If we decline to do business with somebody on the basis of information we have on them, we probably are going to have to disclose that information to them under GDPR, give them reasons why we've refused to do business with them, and back up the assertions we make with facts. So this applies to all businesses, where they've got some sort of a sanctions review or a due diligence review uh, before they do business with people. So be really, really careful when you're refusing to do business with people that you've got your facts right. And be careful in contracts with due diligence services providers to make sure that they're assuring you that they uh, can, can back up the things that they say. And obviously, the last piece of advice, I think, is take subject access uh, uh, requests and subject access rights seriously. Quite often, we find that this is the sort of the first indication that somebody is going to sue you in the future. Make sure you have a process in place for dealing with them. So as I say, fact pattern to me is fairly interesting. Maybe in the US, you're all sick of the Russia and Compromat and all of this investigation. But to us uh, compliance geeks over here, it was uh, something of an interesting case. Jonathan Armstrong, do you have a rant and or shout out for us? Well, I've got a, a sort of both. I've, uh, I've got a, a sympathetic shout out to Air Force Major Abacha Tundi. Now, who is he, you might ask, Tom? Well, there's been a very interesting email doing the rounds from Dr. Bakari Tundi, who is, of course, as you probably know, Tom, the cousin of uh, Abacha Tundi. And you might remember, uh, it certainly sets it out in great detail in this email, that uh, Major Abachi Tundi was the first African in space when he made a secret flight to the Salyut 
space station in 1979. And a very brave uh, Major Tundi has been in space ever since, it seems. He uh, missed a flight home on a Russian flight because uh, his place was needed by retur- for return cargo. And, and I think we should salute a Major Abacha Tundi's bravery in staying up there in space since 1979. And we should also salute Dr. Bakari Tundi for the efforts that he's making, writing to, it seems, millions of people around the world to try and release funds to uh, uh, arrange a rescue mission to get his uh, close relative back. So some people, of course, say that emails like this are just elaborate phishing scams, but I'm sure they don't know the strength of will of Major Tundi, so I salute him. I hope that we can uh, link to the GoFundMe site in our show notes. Uh, so, Matt Kelly, do you have a rant and or shout out for us? Well, Tom, as much as I want to rant for you pausing to talk whether or not I am a young man, I will actually rant about somebody else. Um, so my rant today, first, uh, I would just advise my fellow Red Sox fan, Jay Rosen, to please sit down because I am here to rant against former Red Sox pitching great Kurt Schilling. Uh, To be clear, Schilling was a fantastic athlete. If it were not for his excellence on the pitching mound and his tenacity as a player, I know the Red Sox would not have won the World Series in 2004 and snapped that 86-year drought. I'm very happy that he did that. Off the field, however, Schilling is, I think, just a charlatan and a fraud, and it is time for somebody to call him out as such. Uh, First, After Schilling left baseball, he went into politics developing video games, and after years as a vocal voice of right-wing political views, Schilling and his partners took a $75 million loan guarantee from the state of Rhode Island to launch that venture. The gaming company, of course, promptly went broke uh, after releasing exactly one game, and that left Rhode Island taxpayers on the hook for millions. So there was Kurt Schilling always eager to talk a good game about free enterprise right up until he needed some money. And then lo and behold, there he was with his hands out looking for a gimme from uncle sugar. Second more years pass where Schilling is spouting his usual homophobic and transphobic and anti-immigrant political views on his radio talk show program in 2018. Schilling floated the idea that he might run against Elizabeth Warren for U S Senate. Did he actually do it? No, he chickened out. And then third, just this week, lo and behold, Kurt Schilling emerges in the news yet again. He was a member of the board of advisors for that We Build the Wall organization. That is the charity run by the former Trump campaign manager, Steve Bannon, who was indicted and arrested just yesterday on charges that he was using that charity as a fraud to um, embezzle money for his own personal expenses. So really... Schilling was, uh, Schilling was a superb athlete on the field, off the field. This guy is a dunce who spews right-wing hate, and he does not have the courage of those convictions that he so endlessly boasts about. Enough. Schilling should crawl back under whatever rock he has been living under these days and stop meddling in even more business ventures before more innocent investors and people get fleeced. That's my rant. I'm done. <laughs> Jonathan Marks, do you have a rant and or shout out for us? I have a comment first. Maybe Kirk can get together with Lenny Dyster. They could be successful together. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) My rant this week is our justice system, specifically related to Lori Laughlin and Massimo Gianelli and the sentence that was handed down for them. If you really look at the charges and you really unpack this, one count of each to conspiracy to commit federal programs, bribery, and additional charges of money laundering, conspiracy, conspiracy to commit mail fraud, mail fraud, honest services fraud, and wire fraud. You know, there were studies that have been done that say that, you know, people start to develop their habits very early on. They did studies of people in elementary school and middle school and high school and the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts and, and things of that nature. And I think this is one of those things where you had an opportunity here to send a real strong message that money can't buy your way into you know, college and university, colleges and universities, or can't buy your way into most things. I think a lot of kids are looking at this thing and they're looking at the sentencing and what was done 
and the pleas that were actually agreed to. As And I look at them, I think it's an absolute joke. And I'm embarrassed by our justice system today. So that's my rant. Jay Rosen, do you have a rant and or shout out for us? I do. Uh, we are taping this show on Friday, August 21st. And this comes to us from the New York Times. Facebook spent years preparing to ward off any tampering on its site ahead of November's presidential election. Now the social network is getting ready in case President Trump interferes once the vote is over. Employees at the Silicon Valley company are laying out contingency plans and walking through post-election scenarios that include attempts by Trump or his campaign to use the platform to delegitimize the results of the 2020 election. They have discussed using a kill switch to shut off political advertising after Election Day, since the ads, which Facebook does not police for truthfulness, could be used to spread misinformation. While some may commend Facebook for the preparations in advance of the election, I think this needs to be filed in the three and a half years too late folder. Mike Volkoff, do you have a shout and or rant for us? Well, I uh, I read the uh, Bannon indictment. Uh, I would say if uh, if true, which I'm sure the Southern District of New York um, is probably has a pretty good case. Uh, Bannon's looking at just based on the sentencing guidelines, uh, just for the loss itself, for the 25 million at issue, uh, 51 to 63 months. That does not include any, you know, other calculations that may come into it. Uh, and the case itself, uh, actually, there's some lessons learned for all of us. Again, as usual, uh, we have sham uh, companies. We have uh, sham invoicing and uh, paperwork that goes along to create uh, work that was supposedly done by some of these uh, people who were stealing money uh, straight out for the $25 million. Bannon himself is accused of uh, himself uh, using over a million dollars just for his personal expenses, let alone anything else. So, look, we all it's an interesting case. But uh, as always, let's look at it from the compliance side, aside from the political side, because it is kind of ironic. Uh, And having him uh, arrested off of a sailboat off of the Connecticut shore had to be a great moment if we uh, only had it on video. But uh, I think he's in trouble. I also think there there also are going to be some interesting issues because Eric Prince and Don Jr. are on the board. Uh, and Don Jr. is on video promoting uh, the We Build the Wall. And even uh, the president himself supposedly uh, has made statements backing we build the wall. So uh, interesting case. And let's see, there are twists and turns that can happen. It also, to me, is just interesting when you look back at what happened with uh, Berman and the U.S. attorney. Uh, did the preservation of Audrey Strauss, a, a career person, career prosecutor with a lot of um, you know, sort of bona fides and integrity, was that important for them keeping uh, this indictment alive? We don't know. I'm going to have a uh, shout out to the German uh, financial regulator, Bofin. Uh, And my shout out involves their attempts to supplement the income of those who work for that German regulatory body, because recognizing that government workers, uh, you know, are not the highest paid. Uh, They had a great internal program where they set up an investment pool on Wirecard. Now, the fact that they regulated Wirecard was apparently of of little consequence uh, because they recognized there were great profits to be made by investing in Wirecard, uh, particularly when they um, uh, filed criminal indictments against anyone who criticized Wirecard, including uh, individual reporters at the Financial Times and uh, short sellers who pointed out that Wirecard was one massive fraud. So for those uh, government employees who may regulate secured uh, transactions or companies who uh, base financing on security, you might think about an investment pool. It might really be a way to to supplement your income. Well, gentlemen, this has uh, been a a great uh, episode. I wanted to uh, thank everyone, and I look forward to seeing what we can all come up with next time. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Everything Compliance. 
The Everything Compliance Gang for this episode was Jonathan Marks, Jonathan Armstrong, Jay Rosen, and Matt Kelly. If you'd like some topics explored on Everything Compliance, please uh, send us a message via the Speak Pipe button on the Compliance Podcast Network. I hope you will join us again for our next episode of Everything Compliance, where the gang will get back and look at topical issues relating to compliance and ethics. Everything Compliance is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Thanks again for listening, and we look forward to visiting with you again in our next episode.